Maybe you could go to the picture. Why is it 15 of August 
Second, uh, it, it controlled a big chunk of Europe, what is the new. It controlled essentially one third of Germany. And under those conditions, plus you have in 1940, in 1949, you have Mao Zedong. United, the United States, they had to said, okay, we have to integrate the capitalist world. It's very simple, you know? And we had to prevent any form of further expansion, not just of Communism, because Mao Zedong did not want to go beyond China. Yeah? It was a, a Chinese issue. Yeah? Uh, Soviet Union did not. Soviet Union, Stalin, etc. They did not want to go beyond Soviet Union. That was the whole thing was decided at Yalta, and even before during the war, Eastern, Eastern <coughs> Europe would be part under the influence of the USSR. The, the issue was a bit Yugoslavia. That was the sure there were discussion about Poland uh, and then but they did not have any intention of further expansion they did not have any because they had other problems to deal with you know the, the destruction of the war was so big that, that to, to go on to further expansion would have been crazy but the United, in the United States they made the very conscious decision that 
by using by using this issue of communism to reorganize the capitalist world. They reorganize the capitalist world. <coughs> and, and, and that's what they did. Yeah, they reorganized Japan. And Japan is not right. see ja Japan doesn't say good to the United States. No. Germany every now now can say you tap my telephone, my mobile phone. But Japan doesn't doesn't dare say because Japan exists thanks to the United States. First they bombed it, two atom bombs, okay? And then they rebuilt it. It's the Americans that rebuilt Japan. By allowing and by creating all the conditions for Japan to start rebuilding it. And then there was this miraculous, the most important Keynesian, by Keynesian I mean effective demand, expenditure and generating uh, demand and uh, expansion, except that for Japan, the most important Keynesian effect was the Korean War. The Korean War was, in fact, in Japanese, in Japanese economic historians, they call it gift from God, from the, from the gods, Korean War. Why? Because the Korean War, which was a big war on a small territory, Okay, Korean War was a very big war. It yeah? was not a small war. And the Korean War recreated the Japanese industry because the Japanese were asked to provide all the material and stuff for the United States Army in, 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 in Korea. And so this got they got back the steel industry, the shipbuilding industry. They got, therefore, the financing necessary to do that in order to import the raw materials and stuff like that. That's, you know, United States did all did that for, for Japan. Yeah, I, I have written about this, but there are also very good books by historians. Historians don't have problems of of having the right theory. You know, there are very American historians have written fantastic books about the uh, recovery of the Japanese, how the United States um, uh, basically recreated Japan. The second big Keynesian event, I mean in exogenous expenditure, okay? Expenditure which doesn't come from the calculation of, of capitalist maximal big expenditure. The second very big Keynesian event which affected Asia. This is why Asia is so important. You know, for the United States, Asia is more Europe is important politically, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera, but the but the American economic system is completely integrated with Asia. You know? And the integration of the American economic system is start Japan, then with the Korean War, the Vietnam War, the Vietnam War is what created the Southeast Asian economy. The Korean War was basically, along with bombing of Vietnam, bomb Vietnam, bomb Vietnam. That was another big war on a small thing. To do, to, to, to have that, which was a mistake, it was, it was an American mistake. A mistake in, in strategic calculations. But, because they, they thought that the, the Vietnam, Vietnam, Ho Chi Minh was an ex, a simultaneous expansion of both Soviet and Chinese communism. It was not. No, it was not. So they did not understand that the communist movements in, in, in Southeast Asia were the condensation of nationalistic movement, of independent movement. And they, this day in other. So they went to war against Vietnam for this, in order to block all that sort of stuff. In so doing, they developed, a, they developed, they developed Korea, and they developed Singapore. Singapore, impossible to think of. Singapore is like a super um, extraterrestrial, uh, super high tech area 
basically is totally aseptic. Singapore is, is uh, I don't know, it, it, you have to look into, move into novels <coughs> like Ray Bradbury, uh, like uh, science fiction uh, novels in order to uh, understand Singapore. So Singapore is, it's, it's, like being, it's like being in a completely uh, sanitized, aseptic, no microbe area, okay? It's like being on a, not in an operating theater in a hospital, you know, in a very high-tech hospital. That's what Singapore is, okay? And, which is very different from Hong Kong in that respect. Hong Kong is messy, it's more interesting Hong Kong. Singapore is everything absolutely clean, absolutely absolutely clean, you know. everybody has to have the same haircut, by the way. <laughs> uh, it's, uh, yeah, it's very, it's a very refined authoritarian system, very refined authoritarian, because officially they have elections, etc. Officially, officially they even have free elections, officially. But other things happen, you know. So, and it's super technological. Singapore is super technological. People don't even look at each other. Oh, this is happening also in China now. But, but uh, it's, they don't even look at each other. They only look at screens. So, you know, they look at screens like in, the, in, the, in the Singapore underground, which is completely. But in China, they have subway underground. But, as good as Singapore now, you know, absolutely pristine. The best air is in the underground, okay, in Singapore. You know? <laughs> it's, a, it's completely clean, absolutely clean, absolutely spotless, efficient, no noise, nothing. You know? And people in, in Singapore, they only look at screens. And they even now have, they have kind of uh, I, I, iPads, iPhones, I, iPhone pads, and everything. <laughs> and in which they have a bigger screen so they look at, they watch movies. That is what happens in this, uh, no one reads a newspaper, etc., or a book, etc. They are always, they are automated, they are like robots, robots. And, uh, but Singapore could, but one thing that happened, Singapore was a, a, a traditional Southeast Asian place, you know, with uh, malaria, with uh, uh, diseases, tropical diseases, with dirt, with this and with that. But well, Singapore is absolute. But that's due to the United States. It's due to the United States. It's, it's the, they were wrapped up by the United States. It was the most important, one of the most important American bases during the Vietnam War. But anyway, the United States gave a lot of money to all these countries to sustain it. They even formed an association which still exists, which is called ASEAN, okay? Uh, and, and today this association relates to China. Now all this has been taken over by China. All that stuff has been taken over by China, essentially. You know? And they, this is the result of this huge Keynesian deficit spending by the United States more onto, onto Asia, onto these places, in order to sustain the Vietnam War, that, uh, to sustain the, the politics of the Vietnam War. But that's led to the development of Asia. Taiwan is the same story. Taiwan is exactly the same story. Taiwan is not as bad as Singapore, OK? It's not so sort of uh, uh, space, out of space like Singapore, you know? Uh, it, it's, it's actually quite pleasant. I really like Taiwan very much. I've been a number of times in Taiwan. And in fact, the uh, Portuguese were not stupid. They, they, yeah, they called it Formosa. And Formosa in, 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 in Portuguese means a beautiful wood. Okay? Formosa, beautiful forms. So, uh, Formosa, uh, uh, Taiwan is a, is a very beautiful island. An extremely beautiful island. It's, uh, Subtropical, tropical, and at the same time, there's mountains, and glaciers, uh, and small. Absolutely, very advanced technologically, very advanced. Okay, the people are a bit, are a bit sort of zombies. 
you know. No, they are, because they are, it's like a bit in Switzerland, you know, of the state of the place. It's like in Switzerland, you know, they are slow, you know, because they are sort of cocoon, they are, they are, sort of, they are cocoon. So they always, they, they, the, the real Chinese from China, they always succeed in taking them, you know, because they are smarter, they are, like Napoleons are smarter. Napolitans are smarter than people in Milan. Okay? <laughs> they can treat them. Whereas, not smarter than people in Roma, because he's teaching them. I'm not sure that. But in the case of, in the case, and, 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 and this, this is entirely the result of American huge expenditure and complete and aimed the technocratic type of leaderships. It didn't succeed everywhere. In, in, in Thailand, it didn't, OK? In, Tha in Thailand, is not. Uh, so it, but this created a very big area of development. So in Europe, the long boom was also due to similar, to similar type of processes. Of course, Europe being bigger than just Japan and, uh, and Korea, and etc. It was more complex, but the United States financed Europe in a big way. And how did they finance Europe? Number one, the Marshall Plan. That's a very important. Without the Marshall Plan, no Europe. No Europe. And second, uh, through NATO. And this is people talking about actually a great, great. He was one of the. He one was one of the uh, material, practical architects of the Marshall Plan, whom I met in 1981. I was in the. I was in the. Uh, um, at Middlebury College, Vermont, as a visiting prophet. And they put me in an office with Charles Kindleberger. Charles Kindleberger was professor of economics at MIT, and he was also being a visiting prof at the Middlebury College in Vermont. And he was famous, in my eye, I did not know him very well, so I, I knew that that was in 97, 1981, 19, yeah, 91. And I did not know his work very well because he was the author also of a textbook of, on international uh, trade. It was the textbook at MIT of Inter, which was most boring. It was completely boring. Therefore, when I was told, look, you are going to be put in the same office with Charles Kindleberg, I said, that, but it's boring. <laughs> you know, I fall asleep after, 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 you know, I say hi, and then fast asleep, you know? Because the, the, the person who he was a former student of mine when I taught in New York, he got the first job. The person who invited me, he got the first job in Middlebury College, Vermont. I was then I left for Australia before. But then he said, come for a few months. And he said, you'll be surprised. And, and he was right, I was surprised. Because with Kinderberger, I did not know that, he was. Well, he was. This I knew that he was head of the office. He was head of the office of strategic assessment, OSA, during the war, which is really the beginning of the CIA. And the office of strategic assessment, the task of that office was to to evaluate the economic impact of American uh, allied bombing over Germany. What is the economic? And they came to the conclusion that the economic impact of Allied bombing over Germany was zero, was next to nothing, next to nothing, okay? The, the impact on the population was big, okay? Because it destroyed cities, etc. but the impact on war production of German industry was not very, was not significant. That's what they, they came. But they kept bombing, they bombed less than, than all that sort of stuff. So the, the, the objective was to bomb the population as well, okay? And the, I knew about that. But then he, he was professor and I wrote a boring book, etc. But he told me that he was the number two economist 
that it was big, the number two person in the national plan. Because the first was um, a guy called Robert Triffitt, who was political scientist at Yale, and he was from Luxembourg, from Luxembourg or Bel Belgium, one of the two. Uh, it was uh, migrated to the United States. Um, Robert Triffin is the person who thought up the details of the Marshall Plan. Charles Kinderberger was his, his second, his eight, most important aide, and he told me about the Marshall Plan. And in the process, he also told me, but that comes out in a book that he has written also, that Marshall Plan, he argues, never ended. Because officially, Marshall Plan ended between, it was between 1948, 1948 and 1950, okay, 1950, by 1951, of course. But he said it never ended, it became the NATO plan. So the financing of NATO was really a form of financing of European industry. Yeah. So, that is that where the framework of the long that was the framework of the long book. And in this context, okay, Keynesian policies, Keynesian ideas provided the rationale to strength, you know. But and uh, you know of high the Highway Act in the United States, highway, like Autobahn, Autobahn, uh, Autostrada, uh, Highway Act in the United States, 1954. 1954 was the Highway Act. You know the story of the Highway Act? It's a very interesting, very interesting and very telling story. Okay, when Eisenhower got to, to, to Europe, he was the uh, commander-in-chief of both the American and the British Army. And when they entered Germany, okay, then they saw the German autobahn hmm? that were built in the 30s by, by Hitler. And he said, oh, wow. He said, wow, right? because America had cars, and, but had no roads. It's like Route 66, America had, you know, they had, they had no roads. He so said, we should, we should do the same. We should do the same. America should have, we have a lot of cars, but no roads. We should have exactly the same as in, in, in Germany. It's not the autobahn uh, when he became president, he started to, to campaign for, for, for the highways, right, for the development plan. But Congress in the United States is always very concerned, whether it's Democrat or Republican, doesn't matter. They said, no, no money, there's no money, there's no money, there's no money, there's no money. So I said, okay, these people you know, are really getting on my nerves. And he said, okay, folks, you don't want autobahns, you don't want highways. You know, I said, no, we don't want to spend money. We don't want to spend money. OK. And what about the Russians? You know, if we have to move missiles, if we have to move troops, you know, there is a Russian invasion or a Russian something, uh, a Russian military threat, and we have to move quickly troops, how can we move on these roads? <laughs> these roads that are not capable of carrying you know, tanks and military personnel in a fast, if you have to move them from the east to the west coast. And America is big, so we need fast movement. With, and the this con <laughs> Congress people are completely stupid. <laughs> 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 so, uh, <laughs> we didn't think about it. Ah, you are right, and they voted the bill. So the bill, the Highway Act bill, 1954, Eisenhower to have this civilian type of investment. It was civilian, really. That was his purpose. <coughs> it was not to move uh, missiles. Except, of course, these things become useful during these sort of uh, emergencies and so forth, but, but it was a civilian project, not a military project. He had to pass it as a military project in order to convince Congress. You see how important the Cold War framework was. Also, the development of colleges. The, develop, the big development colleges, okay, but America, but this big, there is a college every five meet, um, every 50 meters in the United States. Every 50 meters, there is a college in the United States, okay? And so, this big development of colleges. 
the, the major impact, the major input <coughs> into this development, creation of countries, is called Sputnik. Is the Sputnik, which was launched in 1957. Okay. Now, when the Sputnik went, wow, oh, the Sputnik, the Russians sent up the Sputnik. <laughs> wow. Okay. Wow. And then immediately they got sort of afraid and all sort of com inferiority complex, whatever you have, uh, strategy, Sputnik up there, uh, beep, 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 and, and so And in the American, American colleges, they were lacking mathematics. It seems that, I don't know why America, Americans don't, uh, uh, don't study mathematics. This is, this is a fact, even today, they don't study mathematics. Um, so, they were lacking in mathematics, they were lacking in languages, and especially in Russian, because the first thing that they, that they, did, that they did said, how come that we did not know about these things? How come we should read everything that the scientific journals, or the Soviet scientific journals, we should read, we should, we should read. Uh, hey, could no one, very few people read Russians. There were some people, there, the two, the people of Russian origin in, in America, there were very few. So they started to recruit massive amount. I actually know, I know uh, she's now a millionaire, really millionaire. She is the wife of a former student of mine in, in New York. And uh, Tanya. She, her father was in Bielorussia. A bit of a collaborationist, okay? Now, he was writing things in a, in a newspaper during the German uh, occupation. Okay. When the Soviet came, when the Russia got liberated, but it would not have been very safe for him to stay, okay? because his name was on this uh, newspaper. He didn't write anything particular. He wrote also a bit of poetry. It is okay. uh, but they would not have been nice to him, that for sure. Okay? So he left. He left and ended up in the United States. It's happened to so many people. And he worked in, in a factory. He worked in a factory. He worked, as a matter of fact, in a meat factory, can factory. But he was a person who was educated at the university in Minsk, and he was, uh, he was a, literary, a literary person, etc. <laughs> Four days after the Sputnik went up, <coughs> they called him and they gave him a position. In a, at the university in New Jersey to teach Russians. Okay? For, so the big expansion of colleges, etc., in the United States is also connected to the community. This is Keynesian economics. That's Keynesian economics. So to do that, you must have a budget, you must spend money. But the impulse of Keynesian economics is what I have called, but actually before me, some other people called military Keynesians. Military Keynesians. Okay. It's military. It's not just military. It's not just Hitler did military Keynesianism by order by rebuilding the army, organizing the army, etc., etc. And that's it, it, that was armament Keynesianism. But military Keynesianism is that you took you take also <coughs> also the development of the of the civil society around. Them. Justified by by Sputnik, by military considerations and so uh, and stuff like that, and that was taken over first by Kennedy. It was expanded by Kennedy, especially by President Johnson, called the Great Society. The Great Society meant, meant that that's the big development of colleges and stuff like that. You know, in order also to face to this challenge technological challenge was perceived as such, military technological challenge, more military technological really, coming from, uh, uh, from the Soviet Union, and so plus the Chinese with communism, things are not looking. Therefore, we have to have a strong, wealthy society and infuse this into the rest of the world, especially particularly hotspots like Asia. And so this is the root of, this, of the long run. This is the real reason for the long term. 
Well, it is, it, it, it's evident that the long boom ended. The condition for that was that the dollar was as good as gold. Namely, that there was a convertibility established at Bretton Woods in 1944, whereby the dollar was worth, uh, OK, uh, um, one ounce of gold was equivalent to, I think, $35, something like that. $35, one ounce of gold. And that parity could not be sustained. Because all this American expenditure abroad <coughs> generated an outflow of dollars, generated a deficit in the balance, overall balance of payment of dollars. So there were dollars floating around, plenty of dollars floating around. And that parity was difficult, was difficult to sustain, okay? And was creating tensions within, especially for countries like uh, Japan, like France, uh, central banks were holding too many dollars, especially Bank, uh, Bank de France, Deutsche, the Bundesbank, and so forth. They were holding too many dollars, and they did not want to have speculative. Because if you know that there are that, that, that there are many dollars floating around, these dollars have to find a position somewhere. They, they, they don't just float around. This means that you should expect some speculative attack, which was then called hot money attack on a certain type of currency. And the number one currency to come under attack would have been that is to push it up, therefore, uh, beyond what they would have wanted it to be pushed up, beyond what the authorities for policy purposes. One was the Deutsche Mark. Okay? The other one was also uh, the, the French franc, but not as much as the Deutsche Mark. So th this created big unease in relation to the, and also it created tensions in the United States, plus the issue of the Vietnam War, which was being lost militarily to, 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 to Vietnam. And all that created a situation whereby Nixon said, OK, look, I'm not going to sustain the gold, uh, the, the gold standard anymore. August 1971, he went on TV and said, Bye. He said bye, and said Do the dollar is not convertible to gold. He devalued the dollar to enhance American competitiveness. Uh, so he, he, he completely changed the rule of the game. It completely changed. That that stopped the long run. It, it created speculative movement onto raw materials. It created that stopped. In, in two years, the long boom was over two, three years. By 1973, 74, it was over. Okay? That, that was over. Uh, that's the end of the long boom. This is where you begin to have unemployment. Before, unemployment did not exist. It did, did not exist. Germany had unemployment of 0 0.6, 0. In fact, they even they were worried when unemployment once got to 1%, 1%. Britain did not have, France did not have, and even also Italy did not have, because if you put together migration, mostly then in the 60s, mostly to Germany, plus the growth of employment here in Italy, here Turin was, you know, Turin here today has 5,000 workers, 5,000. Yeah? In, in the 60s, it had here in Turin 35,000 workers. Yeah? And, Today, Fiat produces 400,000 cars in Italy, in Italy, all over the world, because it has also the bigger part of Fiat is in Brazil, uh, but it has also other places. But in Italy, it produces 400,000 <coughs> cars. In, 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 the, in, the, in, the, in the 60s, it produced 1.2, 1.3 million cars. And then in the 70s, it got up to 2 million cars. Uh, so, the even here, there was full employment, if you include the migration. That came to an end. That was the end of the long And it was the end in the United States, and it was a big end in Japan, too. It ended big in Japan. Okay? Japan had a growth rate like China, 10%. Yeah? Sorry? Yeah. I have a question. But uh, how they did they care that the US uh, 
să uh, udem de igual to calculate and to predict this damage that we see. Was unable. Yeah, well, I mean, with all these ground theories and so on. I think they did not care. <laughs> yeah, about. I think well, I think that this is came as an unintended, unintended consequence. Uh, I think that in the end they thought that America, because the, the deficit of the United States, it, it's not straightforward. The United States had a surplus, you know. Deficit, international deficit, your country, you see, you look at merchandise and also service movements, okay? Merchandise means exports of physical goods, services, tourism, and then capital. And essentially, the United States had a surplus in merchandise till the early 70s, although it was declining and it had increased expenditure on the capital account. That's what, you see, generated these big dollars. The United States had no limit to, all the other countries had limits to capital movement. The United States had no limit. If you were an American citizen, you could export as many dollars as you wanted. Other countries, including Germany, including, uh, perhaps the only other one that was not so con constrained was Switzerland, but all the other countries had a, you could not take out money as much as you wanted, okay? So, plus they had institutional spending, which they still have, you know, because all the American soldiers in Europe, all the financing of NATO, they financed most of NATO for many years, and therefore this meant American dollars flowing into, into Europe and so forth. And this is an unintended con concept. And, and they thought that they could have a growth rate that would sustain, and that anyway, people would need dollar more than the United States. The rest of the world would need dollar more than the United States would need money from the rest of the world. You follow? That, that was the argument. So as long as there is a demand for dollars in the rest of the world, that's fine. You, you can find it. You see? That's what the, that was the, the idea. And, and they were not all that wrong because now, now the amount of dollars which are available in the rest of the world is infinitely more than the dollars that existed that were around then. You see, so in that sense they were not totally wrong. But the real problem came from the thing that the, the, the crisis in the United States, and that was a political crisis, a social crisis that all this sort of stuff, especially the war in Vietnam generally, that was the real problem. Okay. And Nixon said, okay, I'm going to stop the, uh, I cannot afford the recession in the United States with the Vietnam War, I cannot, I will, I'm going to stop the convertibility of dollar to gold. That's it. That's the end of the long road. Finished. Okay. See, this is the real, it's not Keynesian, ISLM, or whatever Higgs are, or the Young, it's got nothing to do. That's the, the real reason. But what happened is that as, you, as the long boom ended, so growth rate goes down, okay, so from, so in the United States actually it went down less than, uh, uh, than, than in other places. The United States growth rate in the 60s was four, around 5%, 4 to 5%. And in the 70s, it came down to basically 3%, mm -hmm. 2 and a half, 3%. The big fall was number one in Japan, that from 10% growth, they came down to 3 to 4%. So that's a big fall, if you go like this. For the, and the other place where other areas where growth rate fell and creation and, <coughs> and became an area of growing unemployment, which never stopped. Um, is you know, in particular Italy again and France, France was really and Britain in the 70s and so on. Less in the case of Germany, but also Germany had 6% unemployment, so it was not. So it reappeared this issue. When growth rate goes down, what happens to the budget? The budget automatically goes into deficit, okay? 
You understand? If the growth rate goes down, it taxes uh, by the, the, the tax revenue by the government is reduced, but, ta but expenditure by the government cannot be reduced. As a matter of fact, sometimes it has even to increase because there is unemployment benefit to pay, to pay. There are also other sort of social security expenditure, essentially. They keep, but they actually increase. So, simply as a matter of accounting, when growth rate goes down, uh, de deficit, budget deficit. And in the United States, People who were not Keynesian said, okay, you see, you have a budget deficit, and you see, Keynesian economics is not working because on the basis of Keynesian economics, you should, uh, with budget deficit, you should uh, uh, be able to cure the recession, the unemployment, and so forth. And that was not successful. That is, uh, that this, this is the framework which allowed the big return come back, the big comeback of monetarism through Milton Friedman. And Milton Friedman never believed in Keynesian economics. Never. Okay, so he's the one who argued that there that is that there is very limited role for fiscal policy. He did not completely negate fiscal policies, but he argued that there is a very limited role and that the fundamental, the fundamental uh, issue is the control over inflation. That, that's the issue. Because the, the, the end of the long boom in the 70s being also connected to the increase in oil prices that happened in 74 and 79, and 74 to 79, the big increase in oil prices also created domestic inflation. Okay? So there were a number of factors. There was the growth of the 60s where uh, created a push in wages. Okay? When, when, when growth <coughs> ended, the wage push, especially in Europe, continued in Europe, more than the United States. Yeah? The big wage increases continued in Europe. The result was that that was translated into higher inflation because the growth conditions were no longer there as before. The second factor was that when the long boom ended and the, and the dollar <coughs> got devalued, in 1971 the dollar went down, raw material producers and also oil companies, they were not happy with all this and therefore a speculative movement started over raw materials which, which pushed raw material prices up. Okay? And that was compounded by the Middle East situation and, uh, and and which led to a big oil price increase in 1973-74, which continued and merged with the crisis in Iran in 1978-79, which led to another and much bigger oil price increase. Okay, so that period was called stagflation, that is to say stagnation, no growth, but inflation. Today we have stagnation, recession, and deflation. At that time, it was stagnation and inflation, stagflation. Okay, it was called stagflation. So the, the, the monitor he said, look, you know, you see your system, your case and framework is not capable of addressing this sort of issue. Inflation can only be addressed in monetary terms, that's what they argue. That is to say, you control the supply of money because that comes directly from the quantity theory of money. Okay? And
So it's, it's from the quantity theory of money that you have uh, this relationship. Okay, so you, you control, the control inflation was controlled, the stock, the quantity, the supply. That was the position of Milton Friedman. With Milton Friedman came the Chicago School. And the Chicago School, Milton Friedman was from Chicago, basically all the pupils of, 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 uh, of uh, Milton Friedman. And they sort of brought in an even more, an even more uh, uh, extremist version of monetary. This is called rational expectations. This is all happened in the, let's say, from the mid seventies, and it lasted till the early early nineties, late eighties. I think it still does today. But anyway, so what the rational expectation people like Lucas in particular, also is a Nobel Prize, uh, from Chicago, what, uh, what these people argue, they argue, um, a, they give you a whole theoretical interpretation of why you can only be monetarist. That is, of why money is neutral. You follow me? The, why neutrality, the issue is neutrality of money. Money does not affect output, contrary to gains. Money affects only the price level. Okay. So their argument is this. America is big. <laughs> That's how I put it in the scene. Uh, I mean, because America is so big and so free, uh, I really want to put in there in their real ideological uh, perspective. America is big and free. This means it's competitive. You follow me? There is a competitive environment. This means that America is the world of general competitive equilibrium. Okay, although it was Valras in France that thought it up, etc. But they say they are convinced. They are convinced that people are there is complete freedom for competition in the United States. Yeah, say, but look, there is General Motors, the big oil companies. America is so big, you know. America is big. And therefore, this area takes competition. So, and the people are rational in the sense of perfect competition. Okay? So, this means that if, if, if you believe, so people know the reality better than Keynesian economists do. That's what they say. And people, American people, they know that America is free and free and competitive. Therefore, in the system of expectations, in the expectations, in the way in which people formulate expectations, they formulate expect economic, uh, all sorts of things. economic expectations, they formulate them by using implicitly, not that they, by using the general equilibrium model. You follow? They don't use it. Really. It's not that they know the general view, but they, 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 they have behavioral uh, characteristics, behavioral procedures, which are consistent with the general equilibrium model. Because the general equilibrium model tells you that uh, uh, the system can be perfectly, can achieve an equilibrium under perfect condition. Okay? That's what they are. Therefore, if you tell them that you are going to do Keynesian policies in the sense of Modigliani, Samuelson, like MIT people that say, okay, in the 
short run we have uh, problems with unemployment, we have budget expenditure, and so forth. We can have deficit case and policies in the short In the long run, we are all on the solo airplane, okay? But in the, uh, you know, we don't disagree on the long run. They say the case, the MIT case. But the short run that, 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 that we have the problem with, uh, they say, look, you are, you are wrong. Because people, since people believe in competition, since America is big and free, and therefore competitive, then if people believe in competition, then they will behave as of today, as of today, they will behave according to the principles of perfectly competitive behavior. Therefore, if you are telling people that you are going to introduce cancer policy, you are making an announcement of cancer policy, these people will not believe you. People will not believe you. So, which will mean that either they, which will mean that either they ignore you, so that your policies are ineffectual, because they, people ignore you, they don't react to their policies. In other words, you announce a deficit spending, and firms don't believe that this deficit spending will do any good, and therefore they will not absorb, they will not absorb the deficit spending. Uh, this is difficult for me to understand, because if the deficit spending is that you order 3,000 planes at Lockheed corporations, the Lockheed corporations will produce the planes. So, but anyway, they, they don't take these case, cases into account. So, but, uh, so people will ignore you, or worse, people will react according to the monetary principle. That is to say, they will react according to the principle that greater Def deficit spending means more money into the economy will lead to inflation. So you are inducing inflationary behavior into agent. Do you follow? Yeah. So that's what they said. And they conquered the, the, the ground. They conquered the ground. But they completely conquered the ground. And what is interesting in this thing is that now we stop. <laughs> <laughs> I want to see the Politburo. Is the Politburo around or not? Uh, yes.
it's a metric. It's something I could work with, for sure. It's a novel. It's a novel. Yeah, it's really nice. It's like, yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's just a metric. Yeah, it's 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 a metric.
to, it's like a zip. Yeah. You're at school, so you have access to everything. You're not at school, but you're not at school. Yeah, yeah. 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 Thank you. 